Good afternoon, friends. We are delighted to welcome you to this really important question for today for for our comments. We are uh, honored to have uh, Christy Padron, the um, scholarly communications librarian, join us today for some really valuable information about uh, how we handle copyright questions in the session, in our, our Canvas course, excuse me. And um, so we are delighted to have Christy join us. And um, Christy, I'm going to ask you about your preference for um, responding to questions. Do you want to save them to the end? Do you want to uh, let us mention them as they come in? That certainly is your call. Just let us know. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Yes, thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Christy Padron, as Judy Summers had introduced. Um, I'm the Scholarly Communications Coordinator at the FAU Libraries, and one of my main tasks is to work with the campus and also with other library faculty and staff to educate the campus community and students on scholarly communications issues such as publishing and other aspects that influence how we communicate our work to each other and to our students. So the title for today's work, Can I Post This on Canvas, is a question that's very frequently asked of us at the FAU Libraries as well as COCE. So we wanted this to give you some information to help you shine some light on how you can evaluate using things for online settings or for Canvas. Um, I will answer questions at the end of certain sections. So. Uh, after I'm done with after I'm done going over a particular objective, I will field your questions. Then um, if some of the questions are a little long, I may have to wait until the end to answer those or even individually respond to you all uh, that way too. If that's if that's another uh, another way that we'll have to go. So today's objectives are to introduce the types of copyright questions that may be asked regarding online teaching. So those that you may have or your colleagues may have done too. We're then going to define copyright and fair use because a lot of these will involve those two concepts. Now, copyright isn't necessarily yes, no answers, but what I can do and what we can provide for you is to outline a fair use analysis as a way to consider using the work of others on Canvas and online settings. And then finally, we'll go into identifying some better practices for using work for online teaching purposes. So just as a quick disclaimer, the FAU libraries, faculty and staff administration, including myself, are not attorneys and we cannot interpret the law. And the information provided is for educational purposes only and does not substitute for advice from legal counsel. So here's some some things we've noticed with teaching online. So the pandemic has rapidly changed the way we teach with the transition to hybrid or online settings. Many instructors and educators want to or need to make availables, I'm sorry, material available online to students since going into the library may not be such a viable option for some people. A lot of times when you want to reuse copyrighted materials online, they're going to be copyright and licensing questions. And we now are challenged by increased needs for using copyrighted works in online settings. We need to have materials in order to teach effectively and so our students can learn. And then also though, we do have to question how to balance our instructional needs while respecting copyright. Here are four very common questions that we have regarding copyright which we will go over through the course of this presentation. We often have questions about what is acceptable for uplo being uploaded to Canvas. Sometimes instructors may find PDFs of materials on the internet. It's great for their course, they love it, and they want to know if they could use it as an OER or an open education resource. We often get questions, especially in the library, about scanning 
chapters of books and other materials and whether if that's whether or not that's appropriate because it's for teaching purposes. And then a lot of times we get questions about if you use only so many words or a percentage of a book that it's okay. And we'll address those questions next. So to give you an introduction to the basics of copyright defined, they are exclusive rights that give creators of work special permissions. So if you write a book, uh, take a photograph, make a sculpture, write a peer-reviewed article, you have the permissions as you hold, if you hold the copyright to distribute it, sell it, uh, publicly perform or display it, make copies of it. You could also create derivative works for it. So let's just say you wrote a book, uh, co copyright law allows you to make like an accompanying workbook to go with that. And then copyright also gives you the um, right to transfer your copyright to others in limited or exclusive ways. What does that mean? Well, if somebody who holds a copyright is giving someone limited rights to use their copyright um, over their work, that means that somebody is allowed to use it in a certain circumstance, whereas exclusive works means like maybe you write a book, you transfer your copyright over to the publisher of that book, and they have the exclusive rights, like they're the only ones with the rights to that copyright grants to, to a holder. Now, copyright is available for certain types of work. Um, some works, I mean, some things that you cannot copyright, like you cannot copyright ideas, recipes, or like, um, like figures like 12 inches, make a foot, those cannot be copyrighted. So really things that are, uh, that can be copyrighted are basically ideas that are put in a tangible form something you could see and touch, such as a literary work. So anything textual like a book or an article may be copyrighted. Uh, computer programs are also considered literary works too in, in current interpretations of copyright law. Musical works such as lyrics and scores are subject to copyright protection. And then so are dramatic works like theater scripts, Pantomimes and choreographic work, so dance routines, pantomimes can also be copyrighted. Uh, pictorial, graphic, and cultural work, such as images, photographs, sculptures, maybe even regalia that reflects a particular culture or heritage may be uh, copyrighted. Motion pictures and other audiovisual work, so the movies, the videos we all love so much, whether it's a DVD or streaming that's going to be subject to copyright protections and then other audiovisual works too. Sound recordings are also uh, protected by copyright and so are architectural works. So copyright is automatically granted once an idea is in fixed form. So once you write it down, guess what? You have the copyright. Now registration or uh, registering your copyright through the US Copyright Office is recommended for legal purposes. So if you want to contest um, somebody using your copyrighted work, you are in a much better position to do that if your work is uh, registered through the Copyright Office, but otherwise it is automatically granted once it's written on the paper, the PowerPoint is finished, the article is complete or the chapter, whatever it may be. Copyright is automatically held by the copyright holder or the creator, and then they can transfer their copyright. As I mentioned earlier, an author of a work can transfer his or her copyright to the publisher, um, and then they would be the people or the entity that distributes the work and gives permissions for that. The copyright law of the United States that you see on the left-hand side provides legal definitions, parameters, and exceptions for copyright. It's a lengthy document, but that is essentially the canon that is currently used in the United States and its territories for how copyright is handled here. All right, so now we're gonna go into copyright, uh, the part of copyright law that we're going to use the most in teaching, which is known as fair use. Educators rely heavily on fair use, which is Title 17 of the United States Code, Section 107. Uh, so this is copyright law that grants reuse of copyrighted materials for teaching, research, scholarly, or creative activities. Fair use is an exception in copyright law that allows copyrighted materials to be reused or copied without the permission of the copyright owner. 
I'll go into a little bit more explanation of what that means for us in higher education. Fair use applies for limited and transformative purposes, such as commentary and critiques, news, or parody. So you can use uh, copyrighted works in limited circumstances and for limited purposes. And these three that I just listed are going to be the main ones. Fair use can be used in nonprofit teaching and instruction settings. So since FAU is a publicly supported university, we can apply fair use in our teaching and learning. Now, places like Barry University or Nova Southeastern University, which are private entities, may have different ways that they may have to apply this. Now for us, going back to what does fair use mean for people in higher education, it allows some copy and sharing, clipping and repurposing some types of works, depending on the details and purposes of its use. And it's going to be dependent on a fair use analysis. Uh, each case of fair use is going to be different and that's going to be in the details. So where do you plan to reuse the work? How much work do you plan to reuse? What kind of document material you want to use? And other details are going to be what influences um, if fair use can apply in your use of copyrighted materials. So doing a fair use analysis is important every time a work is reused. So a fair use analysis will help you consider whether or not your intended use of a copyrighted book, article, video, or other work for instructional purposes, whether it's online or whether it's in person, adheres to copyright. Um, now, before I go and jump into the four factors of the fair use, I do want to assure you that society does need some limit to fair use. Now, I am all for the protection of your intellectual property. Um, I'm all for getting credit for your work, but society does need some limit to fair to copyright. Without these, communicating ideas and expressing them really limits free speech and teaching, which are very essential functions in university settings. So fair use was really built for us, well, to a degree, it almost feels like it was built for us so that we can continue um, expressing new ideas, uh, building on the work of other people, but you know, making new creations with that. So fair use is not a glitch. Uh, it's a very legitimate part of copyright that lets us uh, benefit from the copyrighted work in our teaching. So now we'll go into the four factors of fair use. It is determined by objectively weighing and balancing these four factors that I like to call the pain uh, factors, not pain as an ouch pain, but pain as in window pain. And the four factors will be the purpose of use in a work's character. So here you're going to examine a particular purpose of why you want to use a work. The amount and substantiality of a work that will be used as the second factor that you will look at. The nature or type of work you wish to reuse will be the third factor in a fair use set. Um, analysis, and then the effect of the reuse on the work's demand or marketability will be the fourth factor. A fair use analysis objectively reviews these four factors for a given situation. So next we'll be introduced a little more into the four factors and later, if we have time, we'll identify them for a given scenario. We do have a fair use checklist available at this uh, bit.ly link. Uh, the image that you see is on the second page of that particular uh, particular handout that's available to you all. This is the fair use analysis and checklist that is available to you all. Um, you could download it, you could print it. Uh, it's a good way for you to uh, list some information on your copyrighted work that you want to reuse. And then on the second page, You've got the four uh, fair use analysis checklist that you could look at and consider when you make your fair use analysis. And then finally, it also provides links to where you can get additional information on fair use and copyright in general. So that's available for you all at this particular uh, web page. All right, so going into the first factor of fair use is the purpose of purpose of use and a work's character. The first question you'll ask is the reason for reusing a work. Is it going to be for your teaching scholarship or will it be commentary or critique, whether it's for your work or for your students' work? 
And also you'll need to ask yourself if you'll be using it online or face-to-face. -face. You also can consider how long the work will be reused. Are you going to do it like throughout the semester or are you going to be doing it just one time? Or do you anticipate that this work is so amazing that you will uh, have to use it for every, every, every time you teach the class? And then you also ask yourself if reusing or copying a work will add a new meaning, character, or message to its function. So for instance, a lot of um, instructors like to show multimedia in their classes to illustrate a point. So will a work made for entertainment purposes continue being used that way or will it be used differently? That's one factor that people will consider if they want to use a video clip in a course. Then a final uh, factor in the purpose of a use and works character is under what conditions will the work be made available? Will it only be in Canvas where you're gonna email it to the students? Are you gonna pass out a printout in class or just show it on an overhead projector? Uh, those are other questions that you'll look at in a fair use analysis when you're looking at the purpose. Now part two, the amount and substantiality of a work that will be used. So how much of original work is going to be used in proportion to its entirety? Are you gonna use just one chapter or a few pages? Or do you anticipate using the entire book or article or image? Or is it okay for you to use a shrink down image instead of like the, I don't know, um, original, original size of a work? Then another part that you can ask yourself about the amount of a work is whether or not the used proportion is the most significant part of the work. So is the part that you wanna use what made the people interested in the work or is it a very seminal piece? Uh, that's something that you'll have to consider. Now we'll go on to the third one, the nature of the work. So here's where you're going to ask yourself if the copyright work is based on fact or if it's a creative work. Uh, fair use does favor factual based works like articles with original research, uh, Copyright does have extra protections for creative works like poetry or literature, but it does not necessarily mean you can never ever use it, not necessarily that at all. Then you'll ask yourself if the work is published or unpublished, and if the purpose of the copyrighted work was to inform or to entertain. So was the work created initially for educational purposes or, edu or entertaining people? And then the third factor will be the effect of reuse on a work's demand or marketability. Does copying or reusing the work make it less valuable or affect the demand for it? Will fewer people want to use it or buy it because you reused it or distributed it to a class? So effect is going to be the final factor of the pain or the purpose, amount, nature, and effect that you'll consider when doing a fair use analysis. Now, fair use is not necessarily determined numerically. You could do a fair use analysis and say that three of the three of the four reasons are pretty sufficient in a fair use um, consideration, and that's really not how it works. Uh, fair use is a decision that a person makes by weighing and balancing the four factors. There's been instances where maybe only one factor was was satisfactorily addressed or favored in fair use, but yet courts found it to be adequate enough to be used in fair use. Um, so it's something that you'll have to look at. We made this checklist for you to try to make those, cons those considerations and deliberations and that you start to feel more comfortable with them and familiar with those four factors. You can choose to apply fair use liberally or conservatively. I'm not talking politics here, especially now. This is teaching and learning. Um, I'm talking more like your uh, how open you want to interpret it or if you want to follow as closely to the law as possible. That's your particular choice, which we know that depends largely on risk to tolerance and also values like how um, some people are terrified of getting sued, for instance, and some people feel like they can adequately back up their fair use. So that's gonna be something that you will make the call on there. But otherwise the courts make the ultimate call and what falls under fair use. So now comes the question we've all been asking, how do I apply fair use and copyright to teaching online? And here are four questions that really are uh, very frequently asked questions and can help educate other questions or related ones that you may have about teaching online or using things on Canvas. 
Now, first we've got that question, can I upload a PDF to my Canvas page? When, we, when we're asked this question, here's what we're going to say. You may need to do a fair use analysis and check the balance of its pain factors. You'll look at the purpose, nature, and effect. There are certain things that weigh in favor of a fair use analysis that are, that are indicated by these green um, plus marks. And then there's factors that weigh against. Now, I'm not gonna say if you have one of those negatives, you can't ever do it. That's not, that's not what fair use is about really. So if we look at these, when you do a, when you look at the purpose of uploading a PDF, um, if it's going to be on Canvas and removed at the end of your class, that tends to be favored in a fair use because there's going to be limited access to somebody's copyrighted work. If you're using it for commentary, critique, discussion, or an assignment, that's very favored in a fair use analysis too. Now, if you're uploading a PDF so that the students don't have to buy the book, that tends to weigh against it. And if you plan to use it every semester, mm, that's not so favored either. Now, the amount. If you use just enough of a copyrighted work to reach an instructional goal, that tends to be favored in a fair use goal. So you don't use excessive amounts more or more than what you need. But if you choose to use an entire work, that's not so favored. And again, I don't necessarily want to say just because you have a you know negative here, uh, you can't ever, ever, ever do that. It's just going to be something that you need to weigh into your analysis. Then you got the nature. If it's a fact-based work and it's published, that's going to be favored. If it's a creative work and it's not published or it's not published, that might, you know, maybe, maybe not. You'll have to think about that too. And then finally, you got the effect. My use will not negatively affect the demand for the work. Uh, heck, some people made the argument that somebody's use made the work better known and more people wanted to buy it because of their use. And then the effect is if fewer people will buy a work because you uploaded it, that may be um, a ding in a um, fair use analysis. If you decide your use in this case qualifies, congratulations. Experts recommend that you track your fair use analysis and keep a record of it, and you could use our form for that. One of the main reasons is if you have documentation of a fair use analysis, it will typically show that you did use good faith in applying a fair use analysis and reusing copyrighted materials um, if you're ever contested about the use of a copyrighted work. Now, if you decide that fair use does not apply in your case, you do have some alternatives. It doesn't necessarily mean that's it, can't do it ever again. Uh, first, we can suggest to see if the FAU Libraries has a licensed electronic copy of a work. So whether it's a journal article or a PDF or maybe an image that we have on one of our art databases, um, you can provide its URL to the work in your to of the work to your students in Canvas. That's not considered a copyright infringement at all if you just link. You could also identify an alternative work that is comparable to what you wanted to use. That's an open education resource. So if somebody created some notes, a lab, or even a, a text that they give permissions to use for, um, for instructional purposes, that could be an option. Or you could also use works with a Creative Commons license. Now, Creative Commons licenses tend to be copyrighted works, but the copyright holder puts the creative license on there to give people permission to reuse without asking. And if those two options are not feasible for you, you could also ask for permission from the copyright holder. So you can contact them, explain what you want to do with the work and how you want to reuse it, and maybe they will Maybe they will grant you permissions and maybe they'll contact you and say, well, if you do this, 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 you might, but that's another option. Now for the second question, I can legally scan a chapter of a book and give it to my students because it's for teaching purposes, right? Well, we do agree that fair use favors reusing work for educational purposes, but that reason by itself is not enough. Now, the other part about, um, legally scanning is that the legality and origin of a copyrighted work also comes into question. So in other words, where did you get the work? Did you get it by using legal means? Legally obtained work, that is when the book belongs to you and you want to scan a chapter, that tends to be favored in a fair use analysis. 
but those with undetermined origins are not really favored. Like maybe it's just a scan you found through Google. It might be pirated. Whoever put it up there was not complying with the copyright. So I, we would definitely recommend shying away from those kinds of um, sources located that way. Now, making copies of items for one-time use in face-to-face -face settings does tend to be favored, but it can be very complicated in online settings. So um, an analysis of the fair of the four pain factors will help you decide on that and to see if your fair use is, is uh, if your um, and, um, four factors are balanced to do that. Now we got this question. This was something we really did encounter. I think it was last year. Um, an instructor told us he had found this PDF of a book on the internet and it's perfect for his course. Can I use it as an OER? So once again, the legality and origin of a work also comes into question. The easiest way to check for copyright is to check a book's verso, and that's gonna be the page with its publishing details toward the beginning of a work or a copyright statement that may be there to determine the copyright status and who holds a copyright. So if you find some, if in this case of the professor, the PDF might've been a pirated work. So check for the origin of the PDF. I can say that some online collections of books have um, items in the public domain. That is like they are not protected under copyright and anyone can reuse them and use them. And examples of these are items in Project Gutenberg, which is an online collection of public domain books. And then some titles from the Hadi Trust, which is available through the FAU libraries. If the work has a Creative Commons license, see what it allows you to do with reusing the work. Uh, there's different uh, permissions that you have with the Creative Commons license, so check on those and see if your use qualifies. And then finally, the famous 10% question. The so-called 10% rule is outdated, though many of communities of practice created percentages or portions and guidelines for best practices, but they're not the law. In the case of the 10% so-called rule, that was actually established in 1976 by a community of educators that included librarians, teachers, and people who do interlibrary loan lending. That was recommended as like a best practice for that community, but it is not the same as the copyright at, at all. So when you do look at the amount of work that you use for your analysis, consider the following, and I'm actually gonna skip to the second sub bullet. Use the amount that you determine is essential for fulfilling your teaching and learning objectives. And then keep in mind that using a small amount in itself isn't sufficient. Um, the significance of what you want to reuse may favor against fair use. And to just quickly mention a court case that occurred about this, Harper and Rowe that published a memoir by the former US president, Gerald R. Ford, had sued Nation Enterprises that publishes the Nation magazine. The Nation magazine published what really wasn't more than one page of Gerald R. Ford's memoir concerning why he pardoned the former president Nixon. So Harper and Rowe contested this use because they felt like it, it affected the market and the demand for the book. They figured that most people were gonna buy President Ford's memoirs because people wanted to know why he pardoned Nixon. And Harper and Rowe was successful in that case. So just to give you like a little example of um, you know, the, the amount there. All right, so next we'll go on to some better practices for reusing work. So no, we're not gonna have any percentages or anything like that. These are pretty widely discussed in the library and education community about better practices for reusing copyrighted works. And the first one is going to be to use works that are licensed or acceptable for use in online settings. So Creative Commons licensed works and public domain works are typically very safe bets for putting on Canvas. Online library materials can generally be reused for instruction within an institution. Um, a lot of its licenses allow student uses. Um, you can embed links to library materials on Canvas rather than downloading a PDF that's generally favored when you add a URL. Although a lot of uh, video players do allow embedding because how they look at it is you're looking at the player much, much more than the actual material. Um, so use works that are licensed or acceptable for use. You can also check a works copyright or Creative Commons licenses like we mentioned on looking at the verso of an item. 
do your four, I'm sorry, do your fair use analysis of the four pain, pain factors for copyrighted works. Use legally obtained legal versions of the works and it's important to know its provenance or origin. And then especially because we are, um, you know, we probably don't feel that way sometimes, but we are role models and professional levels. So another good practice when reusing work on online teaching is to model the practices you want your students to follow because they're going to take their cue about how to respect other people's work and intellectual property from us. So for an online class, Professor Ocean in this scenario wants to upload a PDF of a book chapter to Canvas as a required reading for her students. She says the chapter gives an excellent introduction to a concept her students need to learn and will later write about for an assignment. If we do a fair use analysis, can she apply fair use? So we can put in the chat uh, what we think, um, what we, you know, we can try a fair use analysis for uh, Professor Ocean. So here we can take a look at the purpose of her use and the work's character. We can look at uh, why it's being used. Um, is it transformative? Does it add new meaning? And then here we've got the factors that look at uh, what ways to, I mean, towards fair use and what ways against fair use. Um, I'd say that, yes, uh, she's at FAU, so she's, it's a, she's a nonprofit. Um, Criticism or commentary, it is like a, uh, you know, she is using it um, for discussion in the class. Weighing against fair use, creating, a, creating an exact copy kind of like favors against it, you know, weighs against it, but it's not necessarily, you know, negates using it, but that's something we'll have to consider. If we go to part two of her fair use analysis, we'll take a look at the amount and the proportion so how much of an original work will be used and if it's significant amount, let's just say this is a 15 chapter book and she only uses one. Okay, that's a small portion, um, less significant. Is this going to be the reason why everybody buys this book that she wants to reuse or is there a lot of other books in the market that do the same thing? So that's going to uh, be, have to be considered when she looks at her fair use analysis. And then the nature of the book, um, if it were a book of poetry uh, about the ocean, uh, having a creative work might would weigh against her fair use analysis. But if it was something about, say, um, oceanography and ocean science, which is more fact-based, that would definitely weigh towards her fair use analysis. And then the effect on the market when she shares this PDF with her students, is it going to affect the market of this book? Um, will it demand, will it affect the work, the demand for the work? Um, is it restricted since it's gonna be on Canvas? Yes. Um, so those are other, other factors that Professor Ocean would have to take a look at and then add them up and then decide if she would like to reuse those or not. Now this was kind of dense content, but I do want to leave you with some souvenirs. I see that Judy um, and other and COCE promised links to everyone for the materials here. But if you want more information on copyright, we have our copyright libguide through the FAU libraries. We have a tab about fair use where you can get the analysis chart and the handout. We've got a really good explanation of Creative Commons. And if you wish to get permission on using a copyrighted work, we've got like a little page that quickly explains how you could do that. And then we also have more guides on Creative Commons and open education resources. And then finally, we do have our scholarly communication services homepage where you can see what other topics we can discuss with you, your colleagues, or even to your students. You know, we can try to apply copyright to a student level too. If you want more information on the copyright law, you can go to the Copyright Office of the United States, uh, it's simply copyright.gov. And Copyright Office does provide a lot of information, like its circular, circulars on applications of copyright law are very important and will help you learn more about the fair use and other aspects of um, copyright. And there's a lot of really good, artic, um, really good sites for breaking down copyright into layperson's terms. 
The Stanford University Libraries has an excellent page, Copyright and Fair Use Overview. Uh, this reuses content by Richard Stem, who writes the no, no low legal publications and other experts. So I really like that source for um, information on fair use. And then Cornell University Library has an excellent copyright information center, page two, and they've got information about the public domain and other aspects of the copyright law. So those information pages are available to you. I definitely encourage even a glance, even a cursory glance at some of these pages that may be of interest so that you could learn more about how fair use is understood and applied, especially in higher education. Can I download an article from a journal in FAU's electronic collection and upload to Canvas, or do I have to tell students to find that article themselves? or can I only provide a URL, not a PDF? Um, a link is highly recommended. Uh, I mean, I, I could definitely give you a yes answer about using a link to a library source. Um, I can warn you though, the Harvard Business Review is extremely strict about, uh, about doing that. So if it's the Harvard Business Review, you would just have to tell the students how to get to that. Um, they know how valuable their materials are, so for a, Nominal fee, <clears throat> uh, they will, they would let you do that, but uh, otherwise using a link would be the best practice. Uh, PDF, if you just do a fair use analysis, you could look at that, weigh the factors and uh, do that. And some people who apply fair use very openly will do it. Um, I know some attorneys who are almost brazen about doing that. And then if you really want to minimize your risk, you'll, you'll, you'll otherwise decide accordingly. Um, so does that answer the question? Beautifully, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, well, I think I thank uh, the Center for Online continu uh, Continuing in Education for having me here today. It's always a pleasure to come here and share this information with the FAU community. Um, and thank you for the practice that the different people, patient people have allowed me to give so that I could deliver this to you all. So, uh, Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. And if you have questions, you can contact me. My email is kpadron at fau.edu. So you have my contact information there too, if you needed to get a hold of me. Well, thank you everyone for you know visiting us today and, and your time, especially. <laughs>